Close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths. And just try to become aware of what's really alive in you right now. What kind of thoughts are going through your mind? What kind of feelings are you experiencing right now? Just acknowledge them briefly. Is it hope that's present? Is it confusion? Is it pain? Just try to acknowledge each of those feelings and try to locate each of those feelings in your body. Where does your pain live? Where do some of your aspirations live? Where are all of those things? Where are they located in your body? And slowly, as you are locating all of your thoughts and feelings in your body, try to bring all of them one by one into your heart. Bring your hope to your heart. Bring your joy, bring your aspirations, bring your pain, your confusions, all of that. There is enough space there. And now try to put the palms of your hands over your heart, holding all of that stuff, holding it with care and gentleness. Knowing that just like you are holding everything that is alive in you right now, right now you are being held by this gentle and caring presence that's always available for all of us. Try to imagine being held with, with this gentleness and care. <coughs> Try to open every cell of your body to that gentle presence surrounding you right now. Try to imagine that your body is like a sponge. Try to absorb that warmth that is here holding us, holding all of us. And now to kind of invite this beautiful and gentle presence into the room in a more concrete way, I'm going to do a short chant. It's a Hindu Christian chant that comes from Jivandara Hermitage, which is located right outside of Rishikesh in India. That particular monastery was operated by one of my mentors, a woman who was both a Christian nun and a Hindu Swami. Both of those traditions beautifully met there in what they call a cave of the heart. So now I'm going to do this chant to evoke this presence of God to guide us tonight. Om Sri Subhagavati Namaha Esu Esu Yes 
भगवती नम श्री सुभगवते नम यसु यसु यस भगवती नम ओम श्री सु भगवती नम नम यसु 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 And now continuing in this state of receptivity and openness, let us just sit here for a few more minutes and listen to this collage of experiences from the streets of New York that Chris is going to read. And when you're listening to, to this meditation, continue to keep your eyes closed. And remember that this text, don't try to analyze it with your mind. Try to receive it with your heart. Allowing it to touch your heart and open it to grace. It's night time. I'm walking outside the Port Authority bus terminal, that depressing brick behemoth on 42nd Street and 8th Avenue that is the main hub for buses arriving to and departing from New York City. I'm looking for homeless kids, trying to spot new arrivals that might still be hanging out, unsure of where to go. I keep my gaze active, scanning the outside of the various crevices of the building. Tonight, like every night, there are about 4,000 kids in New York City who will spend the night on the street. While most of us will be comfortably resting in our beds, many of these 4,000 will sleep on the subway in an abandoned building or with a person with whom they may well have to compromise their dignity in exchange for a place to sleep. I want to reach them, to offer help before they disappear into the Manhattan sinkhole. But I'm not the only one looking for them. As soon as they step off the bus, there is a chain of pimps waiting for them, ready to promise them their future that they dream of, ready to mesmerize their minds, stab their souls and imprison their consciences. In 2004, Taz Tagore and I co-founded the Reciprocity Foundation, an organisation that offers street youth support and helps them build healthy and successful lives. Our job is to catch the kids before they become victims of this never-ending cycle of horror, abuse and prostitution. It is just a question of who gets there first. A long time ago I learned that if I want to be effective in my work, I have to walk the streets with certainty. I have to act and feel as if these streets are an extension of my living room. This aura of ease confuses all the pimps and the other sketchy characters here that are used to seeing fear in everyone around them. They are not sure of what to make of me. They don't know who I am or who I run with, and so they leave me alone. I walk into the station to see if I can find any newcomers. Kids come here from all around the country for various reasons. Some because they were asked to leave by their parents. Some because their families were too poor to take care of them. Some because they aged out of the foster care system. Upon turning 17 or 18, they were simply dropped off at the Greyhound bus station and told to follow their dreams. Some come here because they have suffered abuse by a family member, and the only way to escape that, other than suicide, is to run away. Some kids come to New York City because they are gay and they have been kicked out by religious parents who believe that the harsh reality of the street will convince them to change their ways. Over the years I've met thousands of famous kids. Some I was able to help, and some I lost. So here I am today, walking these streets, prayerfully knowing that each time I see a kid, it might be the last time. Knowing this changes everything. Knowing this lends urgency to my work. As I continue to walk, faces of kids I have known appear in my mind's eye. There is Tanisha who got shot by a pimp. There is Nikki who was kidnapped by two fellow shelter residents and turned into a prostitute. There is Larry, calling me on the phone crying, telling me he was just diagnosed with HIV. There is Tony telling me how he is haunted by the memory of his father killing his mother as he looked on, a frightened child. These stories are so horrifying and yet so typical. They are the shared daily experiences of thousands of street kids. 
I take a few more steps into a dark alley, only to notice a kid I know getting into a stranger's car. God only knows what will happen once she gets inside that car. <coughs> Seeing this, it is just so easy to give up, but I cannot do that. The kids we have helped through the Reciprocity Foundation tell me that we are their only family. They say our centre is the only place they have ever felt loved. I stop for a moment and recall all the happy faces I've seen over the years. Kids who went through our programme and whose lives have changed. Kids who discovered their talents and now work with other struggling teens. Kids who graduated from college and are now beacons of hope in this hopeless world of the streets. Kids who recently made a film called Invisible, Diary of New York's Homeless Youth. It aired on a major network, was nominated for an Emmy Award and showed everyone that homeless youth, once given proper attention and care, are capable of doing great things. All of them came to us in a state of despair and through the foundation got what they needed to lead purposeful and meaningful lives. Thinking of them, I know that I cannot, I will not give up on those in need of help. It's 3am and time to go home. As I walk towards the subway, I try to hold all of those faces in my heart and offer them to God. Along the way, I hear a mad street preacher desperately screaming, Where is God? Where is God? Where is God? I look at him and the words of Mother Teresa come to mind. Jesus is the hungry to be fed. Jesus is the thirsty to be satiated. Jesus is the naked to be clothed. Jesus is the homeless to be taken in. Jesus is the lonely to be loved. Jesus is the unwanted to be wanted. Where is God? He is here on this street, lying naked in the gutter. He is here on this street, homeless. He is here on this street, in all the lonely and unwanted, waiting for our love. As I continue my walk towards the subway, I wonder, what would it take for us to notice him?